from Melrose Arts, this is Art in Action, a series of live art demonstrations by prominent local artists. Working before an audience, the artists describe their process and answer questions about their technique. They show you their approach to art in a very personal way. From the art of encaustic, reverse painting on glass, fiber art, and calligraphy, it's all here. Sponsored by Melrose Arts, a volunteer group dedicated to encouraging the visual arts in Melrose. These monthly art demos are open to the public and free of charge. Today on Art in Action, mixed media artist Deborah Claffey shows us how she uses line and contour for an expressive still life in oil. Deborah is a visual artist who works with oils and caustic and mixed media to investigate life on planet Earth. We're going to talk about oils and still life. I've been, I was working this way for a long, 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 long time, oil. A lot of it on paper, a lot of it with uh, graphite drawing in. My general process is to draw, paint, draw, paint, draw, paint. Um, part of the process, because there's so many things stay in the studio for months and they just keep getting worked. If I don't like what I see, then I paint over or I cover it up and I draw again and I start over again. So maybe after 10 months or so I might ha end up with a painting, but there's no way to show you that here. So I brought three pieces and started them and then, so this was the, the original drawing with a little bit of fill in and then repainted again with the first layer sort of blocking out shapes and what's in front of what and what's in back and behind maybe some of the colors. And then the third one, this is where it starts to change, where I actually cover over the whole painting and essentially start again. But this is part of the process, back and forth, back and forth. I don't know that I can talk and paint at the same time, so let me do a little bit of both. My next step here will be to take this one to more or less that shape, that position. I paint on paper and it's not gessoed but I did a little bit of research and found that the sizing, this is BFK, Reeves printmaking paper, and printmakers use oil-based paints all the time. It's just it has a little bit less linseed oil in it. The stand oil, the plate oil that they use to uh, make the, the color movable, it's just got a lot less linseed oil. So I don't use too much medium when I'm painting on paper. We have a mandolin, and we have a yellow pitcher, we have a white pitcher, I was going to bring them, just would be fun because it's always the same, the objects. There's a crystal uh, coffee urn, a couple mugs, and uh, a chair. But then there are all these plants that are in my studio all the time. So it was always the philodendron gets in the picture, and this night-blooming cirrus gets in the picture all the time. And I think they just like having their portraits painted over and over again. So you don't necessarily set up a still life you just refer to those shapes? And just yeah, it's sort of set up. The chair is there. In the, I mean, all the house plants are out in the yard in the summer, and then in November, I got to cram them all back into the studio. And so there's a chair with all this stuff sort of just piled on it. I used to set up the still lifes, and I used to set up all the lighting and then do lots and lots of drawings. But I think at this point now I'm referring you know, because I think that's an important point. I'm not necessarily trying to create a picture of a corner of the room. I'm not really interested in the particular lighting or so much the relationship of the things to the airspace, but more pattern. I'm looking for pattern and movement and gesture, I think. Who knows? So. Got to see what we got here. Why do you prefer paper over canvas? Um, the absorbency. I've done some experimenting with absorbent gessos, and I can almost get a canvas to behave the way the paper does, soaking it up, and then going this gorgeous soft mat. Do you do any sketches ahead of time, or are you just? Um, I just go right in on the paper. Yeah. So I figured you didn't want to see that part because I'd have to bring all that stuff down here.
tend to use one size brush most of the time? Or do you switch it up? I try to switch it up and I forget a lot. Uh -huh. I'll start working and not even think about it and then realize I've been using the same thing and then, you know, the, the, the school teacher, vary your stroke. You know, you start hearing all that stuff in your head. But all right, we need this. That's green. something in there. All right. There's something about knowing that you can go back and make changes that saves you from getting too crazy. All right, next step. This is my favorite part. I don't know if I can do this in the way here, but. Part of why I like to work on paper is because I can't get this to work on canvas because it kind of just goes in there, you know? What kind of pencil is that? The softest, darkest one I can find. This is, oh, that's Karen Dosh. That's not the one I meant. This one is Derwent Onyx. And I haven't, yeah, I didn't put enough paint on. You'll see it with the next one. This is the, it's a night blooming sir. It's just the craziest plant. This is all these lumpy, bumpy shapes that are just so much fun. Because you're so familiar with the subject matter, have you ever done one completely from memory, just not any reference at all? Yeah. And, and that's okay for a while, but then I find I need to go back because then it starts getting automatic. We don't want that either, so. But the other, th you know, I'm in the studio now, from now until April, and these plants are right there. Would this be something that you would do flat, what you're doing now? Yeah. yeah. You can get... In more detail if it was flat. Uh, maybe not more detailed, but definitely a better line. Mm -hmm. Darker? Um, not much. I think I'm not putting a lot of paint on here, for, probably because I'm nervous, but um, when there's a lot of paint, it doesn't need, to be, doesn't need to be as hard to get through. But again, this is just like 
one or two layers in, so we're fine. This is a day after this. And that's the other nice thing about working on paper, because canvas, I'd have to wait, what, two weeks? Three weeks? Paper is like almost the next day. I've been feeling like I was using the same greens all the time. So I've been working on try to, trying to vary. I think there's, there's a problem when you're trying to do pattern that it can take over. It, can, it has a mind of its own. So it might be that what somebody said about going back to look at the plants. I love this mandolin. It's the wildest thing. All right, let's do that. So what do we got? We need some. You have to turn your pieces as you're working on them for a different orientation just to see how they... I do. Okay, not so much in the middle of it, but when I'm sitting there staring at things. This funky plant is an acanthus, which turns out to be the plant that all the Roman architecture uses for the finials and the column tops and things. I get lost in the trying to get the shape right.
So what else do we need here? See, so that might be good for the next step. And then I'll let that dry. And do it again. And sometimes the next coat, the lighter colors on, it'll scumble over the ridges and get caught in all kinds of cool places. And so this one was in that condition, and I went over it with alizarin chrysanthemum, which should be a transparent color and would have given me just uh, muted, would have changed all the colors a little bit so they related to each other better. But the white wasn't quite dry, so it's not as transparent as it was supposed to be. So, all right, we're getting goopy now. We have several layers on there. I, I've moved over to Galkid for medium. I used to make my own, and I don't know, remember who taught me at the museum school, but it was a third Damar and a third linseed oil and a third turpentine for an all-purpose medium. But I'm thinking I like the, lately I've been liking the Galkid better. And here's our yellow pitcher. Sometimes things just work, it used to be, I push it more now, but sometimes things used to work the first time very easily. And you learn to recognize that it worked and leave it alone and have somebody take it away from you. So how long have you been painting the yellow pitcher and the <laughs> glass bottle and the well, they handle it? And they, see, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? No, 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 no we're not judgmental. We just <laughs> They're um, like your old friends, you can see. They really are. Them out and I found them at cool. tag sales and flea markets and stuff. Um, is, let's is see. Ten years like you were doing at, portraits? Yeah, at least. It's in 1992, I think. Mm -hmm. And there were others, you know, and they're sort of relegated <laughs> to the <laughs> shelf at the moment. You know, the clay pitchers are up there and the glass vases, they're all up there. So are these op still objects to you that you know, or are they just... Uh, a stepping off point for a pattern. Stepping off point. I do like that yellow. That yellow gets things, and the cups, they don't always end up in the painting, the color they are, but the particular yellow, green, and blue of the cups in the still life are pleasing enough to start something. And it, it doesn't end up that way all the time, you can't tell. You might not know. This is the part I like when the paint stays on top. Spindles. This chair is so falling apart. Maybe I'll pretend it's in there too. So you see there's no system to doing back to front or dark to light or, or even in the lines. All right, let's find some blues here. Cadmium? No, cerulean. But because it's got, 
it's all um, relative because it's got a gray underneath. Okay. It's going to pull sure. pull forward. So it, there may have been some green under here to start with, and then I put the alizarin, which turns it gray. Sure. Color theory, right? Complimentary, Complimentary colors. So this night blooming cirrus, which is what this is, it blooms once a year at midnight. Fragrance intense. I'm <laughs> Unless it went to night blooming heaven. <laughs> it was beautiful, but it, it just the fragrance was really huh. it I mean, yeah, when I forget that you're all there. And what happened? Okay, let's take some of that. Yeah. So you use the pencil to add your marks, your lines, but do you ever use something to scratch through the paint too? The pencil does that. Oh, so that reveals the under color. Yeah, colors. sometimes it leaves leaves the the graphite behind, but sometimes it it'll let that gray through. Oh, okay. The pencil seems to work best when you're doing a light color and you're scratching through to get a dark shade, mm -hmm. but we're never that organized to be thinking about it. I get fascinated with negative space when I like playing, making it pop out. like this mint green. So I think um, it looks like I'm painting the same picture over and over again, but part of that is mainly to show you that each of these would go through, because I can't have you wait for all these layers to dry. so that you could see that it was consecutive.
Okay. Yeah. Out of gas. <laughs> thank you. Wow, thank you. Deborah Claffey has shown us how to paint an expressive still life in oil using graphite for line and contour. Be sure to check her website, DebraClaffey.com, for further examples of her fine work and to learn of upcoming shows and classes. Visit MelroseArts.com for information about Melrose Arts, upcoming events, and future art in action demonstrations. Melrose Arts, dedicated to encouraging the visual arts in Melrose.